And my understanding is that there was already a considerable Jewish community in Shanghai before the exodus from uh, Vienna and other European cities, uh, in part from Jews who had um, come there in the uh, uh, civil war between the communists and the white Russians and other uh, Jews who fled those disturbances much earlier. D did you run into a large Jewish community in Shanghai? Really, uh, in Shanghai, when we came there, there was a Russian community, very Jewish, that come. From, there were white Russians who had come from Harbin down to Shanghai, and then there were the Sephardic Jews, the Kaduris, the Abrahams, who had made a huge fortune in Hong Kong, and there was uh, Sir Kaduri, who actually funded the schools and gave scholarships and they helped the Jewish community. The Chinese were in no position to help us. So we were actually helped by Jews helping Jews. And I want to tell you one ironic thing. Sir Horace Kaduri. Sir Horace Kaduri had a very limping head, and he would always come and pat us little children on the head and give us candy and stuff. He had a huge mansion. I just learned that his grandson, he's long dead, um, another Kaduri has just come here because he owned um, one of the motels in Carmel, a quail lodge. He was an owner of it, and it was closed because he could not pay higher wages to Spanish-speaking migrants. So he was a the family began philanthropic and ending the oppressing right here. Yes, there were some refugees who came before 1938, uh, between the time of 1936 and 1938, those were the foresighted ones. Uh, many of them were well educated. They came early, could take many of their possessions along, and established themselves quite well in Shanghai in those days, became civic leaders, and very successful business people. And I actually happen to know um, there's a member of that community in the audience, the, the um, Leah Garrick. Do you want to just say a, a comment about the question? Um, we're always a byline. I'm part of the Sephardic community who was there for 100 years and I'm a fourth generation Shanghai Lander, and it was due to this particular community that gave a, a succor and aid to the refugees who came in. But I do have a question for you, Manly. We were both on a Caribbean cruise where we spoke together. Um, I just want to mention, wasn't your father honored by Yad Vashem in Jerusalem for his work as a righteous uh, man among nations? Um, yes, he was in uh, the year 2000, three years after his death. Um, Israel, the state of Israel gave him um, one of their highest honors, which is um, called the Righteous Among the Nations also known as the Righteous Gentile. Um, and, these, um, and this award is for people um, who have saved Jews from the Holocaust. And uh, it's not given lightly. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a state agency um, that Israel has established, and they do this extremely thorough investigation um, to determine whether to look at the evidence. And so after three years, um, they, did, they designated him a, a righteous. And uh, six months later, my brother and I went to Jerusalem uh, for a ceremony. Is there a question over on that side of the room? Yes, sir. I'm Alan, Lai's husband. You don't know uh, some things about my wife, and I'm not going to tell you too many secrets either. But you ought to know that 
She has spent her life as a freedom fighter. She's done many things beyond the call of duty to become a really valuable American citizen. She was one of the members of Women for Peace during the depraved Soviet American nuclear arms race. She founded a, a clinic in Salinas, California during the height of the farm worker wars. Salinas was a plantation in those days. The people in the fields were living, in fact, in psychological and economic servitude. She founded the settlement house, taught them English as an empowerment tool. That was after we lived in Mexico for three years and had learned fluent Spanish. And currently, she's involved in, in, a, in a movement called Village Elders to allow older people some means of staying in their own homes and not being institutionalized or warehoused, even if they have the money, as is often, unfortunately, the case. So the, her experience in China after she recovered, and she recovered quite quickly, and she recovered by herself. It's true that I was there. I knew that she would recover. I knew that her spirit would triumph. Now she, her, one of her main preoccupations these days is to, is to help facilitate the movement towards village elders, which is allowing older people to remain in their own homes, supported by their own communities. So that's about all I want to say. Saludos. Another question? Yeah. After seeing uh, Shanghai Express, my Shanghai Ghetto, sorry, um, my total um, recollection of it is the horror, the streets that were full of two feet of sewage and rats and, and, and the excruciating poverty. And I heard both of you speak, and all I heard was family and small family dinners and hope and retribution. And, and spirit, and I, I just don't see how, how you came through all of that with, with the spirit, and that what you said today was just so remarkable. And did you have memories of the other, or was just spirit what got you through? I want to answer that. I don't remember my saying, or anyone saying anything like that. It was a horrible time. We were near starvation. And uh, we were surrounded by sickness, uh, cholera, dysentery. You couldn't drink the water. You had to be careful. You couldn't eat lettuce or any, any vegetables, especially towards the end. The food that we had available diminished uh, all the time. We were near starvation. And my father died, uh, that was already in 1942, partially because of the starvation. He didn't have the strength. So it's, we, we were the young people at that time, and I think our parents suffered a great deal more because not only on top of everything else, they worried about us. And we were not exactly aware what was going on. But um, we had a tough time, really tough time. I, I want to second what Renee said. It's our parents who, who gave up their lives. They were in the best years of their lives. And my mother went into a big depression that she never recovered from. I think my point in my story is I was young. We were children. We were resilient. Shanghai, in some ways, was an adventure. My parents didn't have me come home at a certain time. I was never told what to do. I had a certain liberation. I could look at Shanghai. I could look at it as something new to me. It was fresh. Everything was different. But they suffered. And I think my point here was we had 64 years to recover. And so we are trying now to recover our own recovery, which easily slips away. 
but the cost to the people who were in their 30s and 40s was enormous. Divorces were on the increase. Suicide was on the increase because we didn't know how the story was going to end. Looking forward to a story is very different than looking backwards. You can recreate it. Don't you agree? I do agree, and I must tell you also that living among the Chinese at the time, they were suffering even more so because they had no organization and they didn't have an appreciation of hygiene that we had, so we could, uh, they probably couldn't read. So we saw their suffering. As we saw our own, they were starving even more so. And they had to live amongst the rats and the <laughs> insects and everything else, which bothered us too. But we were better organized. Yes. In terms of their racial alliance, um, saw the Chinese as the very bottom. Our relationship with the Japanese, fortunately, they, they were a little careful how they tr would treat us because of the history between the Japanese and the Jews dating back to the Russo Japanese War, where a Jewish banking group loaned money to the Japanese so they could defend themselves. Uh, they had respect for the Jews because of the fact that we are, have a long history of tradition and our religion and, and knowledge, and they respected that. Uh, we were also saved, you recall, by Laura Margolis. Laura Margolis was a social worker from the Jewish Joint who was sent to see what's happening with the Jews in Shanghai from the United States. Laura Margolis, when the Japanese came after Pearl Harbor, could have gone home, but she stayed and she made sure that the Japanese would accept $100,000 US dollars monthly to bring into Shanghai to help us establish a hospital, the Ward Road Hospital where I worked and where my father died of kidney cancer. It had an operating room. It was a hospital that lacked all uh, equipment, but it had more German and Austrian doctors that they could fill the hospital with. So it was a contradiction, but it was all improvisational and it helped. There was a night I remember when I worked there where there was no heat, and eight babies died in the, in the nursery, you know. But the Japanese allowed that money to come in because they needed for arms. So it was always self-interest. But yes, it, we were on the edge. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Oh, yes, sir. Or ma'am, sorry, <laughs> couldn't see whose hands. I was hoping uh, Manley would answer the question that Lottie posed um, to, uh, your, to your father about his feelings about the communist takeover. That's a very long and complicated answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, father, my father, who, I mean, I mentioned earlier that my father like his generation of Chinese, was fierce about um, China becoming um, communistic, so um, okay, fierce about China not being humiliated or colonialized. So my father ended up, uh, when my father was growing up, um, he became enamored of the philosophy and principles of Shen Yat-sen, who basically, were, that was the 1911 revolution that overthrew the Manchu dynasty. And Shen Yat-sen was essentially a social democrat. He wrote the three principles of the people. In other words, it was, 
I think a very altruistic um, philosophy. And there were young, young men like my father who were very taken by it. And I think deep down in, in his heart, my father was a romantic. And he had a very idealized version of what he thought China should be and what he thought it should be become. So when the communists took over, he was in Egypt um, where I was born. I, had not been, I was not born yet, but in 49, the communists took over and he had a choice of either going with the nationalists or the communists. And he chose the nationalists because that was the party that he joined. And that was the party that became the successor of Sun Yat-sen's philosophy. Now I say successor in quotes because we know um, what that regime really was. But I think my father never lost those ideals and therefore um, he chose one side over the other. But I have to say that in after the Cultural Revolution in China, when Deng Xiaoping emerged and basically um, it was a Luan Fan Zun, which means that you, uh, I don't know how to translate that. Um, in other words, you, you uh, end the chaos and restore uh, the righteous, the right way. Um, my father was actually very enthusiastic about that because I think, again, it raised his hopes of what China would be. And in some ways, you know, in a, it, despite all that Western, Westerners think about China and think about its um, human rights records and think about its path, you know, China is, has stood up, ha, is on the way to becoming a world power. And I think in some ways that if my father were alive today, he would, I think he would be very pleased by it. You know, I mean, obviously I think he would realize that no path to selfhood is uh, fraught, and is, I mean, pa the path to selfhood is fraught with a lot of ups and downs, that there are a lot of black, bat, black patches as well as great patches. Um, well, but I think on the whole, he would have been, yeah. What would he have said about Tiananmen Square? What would he have said about the Olympics and people, dissidents being hauled away to not appear there? How does one deal with that, with such a big power? I, I don't know what he would have said, but I'm, I don't think his answer would be what you expect. I mean, he would not have responded in the same way as somebody who's a Westerner would respond. I mean, he would respond f f to it from a Chinese perspective. And I can't speak for him now because I don't know, but I think if I had to hazard a guess, um, you know, Tiananmen Square, whatever Tiananmen Square was, the reason that there was this kind of clampdown was because the communists came to power through student marches and th student demonstrations and student um, unrest. And so see, for the communists themselves to see that happen, it, became, it was a very huge threat because that's how they came to power. So, you know, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, the other thing is, in terms of the Olympics, I think most Chinese, the, the man on the street in China, most Chinese here, most Chinese abroad would feel actually very proud that China had gotten to a point where it was able to host something like the Olympics. Um, you know, I mean. But it's the same problem as in Russia, where the dis where face becomes everything, the front, where you show to the world 
but what's inside is held back. Is that a West? It's a Western value, but it's something other countries have to learn, no? I don't know. It seems to me. Well, you know, I think that, you know, the path to democracy or the path to um, enlightenment is a very long path. You know, I mean, look at this country. You know, I mean, things did not happen over, and this country had, came from a tradition of uh, individual rights and individual liberty. I mean, that's what this country was founded on. You know, most of the countries that we're talking about here, and including China, do not have that, are not founded, are not based on that kind of thought or that kind of philosophy, you know, of the rights of an individual. So I think that the path to that, if that's what you want to have, is long, it's fraught, it's not straight, and I don't think it can be hurried. Um, I think it's an evolution. Um, it's an evolutionary process. And I think everybody, um, and I think you have to give people a little bit of leeway in that because nobody's going to be perfect. There's always going to be injustice and inhumanity. I mean, I, unfortunately, you know, uh, that's part of human nature and it, it happens. I mean, we should all stand up and rail against it. But on the other hand, you know, the, the, the path to an enlightened state um, is long, it's arduous, and it's not perfect. The post-World War II generation and young people that I work with as a, as a psychologist now, in their 20s and 30s, who are educated, and who are not poor, and who have less pressure, are showing a kind of cynicism or sign because of what they've seen, that there is no justice. And so while totally there is no justice in, in the deepest sense, there is also the need to keep it up in front of people, to engage them, to tell them to stand up in the way your father did stand up against an injustice. And that seems to me is what's inspirational. That's what we have to do. Not the results, but to remind people that we have to stay engaged and not be cynical. Thank you. And I think that's a great note to end on, that we should all stand up when we see injustice. <laughs>